Hello, hello, and welcome to In Time. With me today is is Zandering, uh, and we are here to discuss uh, the new variant. Now, the World Health Organization has designated the Omicron variant. It is was originally referred to as B11529, and they've designated it a variant of concern. The World Health Organization said on Friday that uh, early evidence suggests that the Omicron variant, first identified in South Africa, could pose an increased risk of reinfection and said that some of the mutations detected on the variant were concerning. The World Health Organization has also stressed that more research is needed to determine uh, whether the variant is more contagious, whether it causes more severe disease, and whether or not it could evade uh, the vaccines. Quote, this variant has a larger number of mutations, and some of these mutations have some worrying characteristics, said uh, Maria Van uh, Kirkov, uh, World Health Organization's uh, technical lead for COVID-19. Quote, right now, there are many studies that are underway. So far, there's little information, but those studies... Um, um, those studies are underway, so we need research to have uh, researchers to have time to carry those out, and the World Health Organization will inform the public and our partners and our member states as soon as we have more information. She needs a writer. Um, Omicron was first identified by scientists in South Africa who raised alarm over its um, unusually high number of mutations on Thursday. Since then, at least uh, a dozen Others, uh, oh wow, a dozen other countries uh, have uh, confirmed cases of the new strain, with several reporting um, other suspected cases. A apart from South Africa, the variant has been found in uh, uh, Botswana, Belgium, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, Denmark, UK, Germany, Israel, Italy, the Czech Republic, and Hong Kong. On Sunday, D Dutch authorities have announced that at least 13 people have uh, tested positive um, for uh, after arriving from South Africa. They've tested positive for the new um, variant. The Netherlands National Institute for Public Health and the Environment said in a statement that the variant has been detected through sequencing of 61 positive uh, COVID-19 samples, and it is po uh, possible, they said, that the new variant will be found in even more samples. Israel over the weekend became the first country to seal its borders entirely to all foreign travel in response to Omicron. Morocco has said today that it would deny entry to all travel, even Moroccan citizens, for two weeks beginning on Monday. The United States, uh, Britain, Canada, and the EU, and other nations have all announced ban on travelers from uh, South Africa, where the variant was first detected. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss... Uh, uh, what we know about this variant, we don't know a whole heck of a lot. We do know one thing, and I, I, I think uh, student Dr. Ben brought this up, but I, I wanted to, to say this at the outset, um, which is that uh, the reason we are supposed to be wearing masks is obviously in part to keep people from getting infected because we want to save lives. But the other reason is because the more people that get infected, the, you are literally a, a Petri dish, and you... Uh, uh, as the the virus uh, grows in you, it has the ability to mutate. This is just basic uh, evolution 101. And uh, the more people that get infected, the more mutations we are going to have. We are now past uh, the point of probably stopping this from becoming uh, an epidemic if it isn't already there. Uh, but we at least have the ability to hopefully slow down the rise in new um, variants. The initial data on the Delta variant, at least from what I'm seeing, looks looks a little concerning. Uh, but that's why we're going to talk to people who know far more about this than I do. Uh, and but that's uh, one of the big important aspects of masks that people have not been talking about isn't just to keep you safe and keep you from getting sick. It's to keep the virus from being able to create new uh, and far more deadly uh, variants. So. Uh, with that, we'll bring out our guests in one minute. Um, is Andrew, how are you? I am in my bug out bag <laughs> with my bug out vehicle. I'm heading to the hills, far northern Canada. See you when it's all over. With your AR-15 and, and your other guns. Yeah, I know. I, I know. Um, yeah. oh, what's really bad is now I'm making... I'm, I'm ready for the zombie apocalypse now. I, I am making uh, um, pro Second Amendment arguments for the like they make a stupid argument. I was like, no, no, no. Here's the better argument. I was like, I can't believe I'm fucking helping this these guys now. Thanks for that. All right. So uh, today our guests. Hey, no uh, problem. Yeah. 
student Dr. Ben, and uh, Homo Zygos. So uh, without any further ado, gentlemen, how are you? I'm doing all right. Happy to be here. This is my first time on the show. I know. Congratulations. And Maya, Maya was just like, is Ben here? Is Ben here? Just like, yes, Maya, Ben's here. I'm here too, by the way, you know. Jesus. Okay. Um, <laughs> and almost I go returning. How are you? Full of pumpkin pie. Thank you for having me back. I'm like trying not to go into a food coma right now. Uh, it's better yeah. than an actual coma, so <laughs> I'll take it. So ben was kind of nodding off a little bit. He was going like, you know, <laughs> this is back steps. I'm feeling the oh, same thing. Oh, it's the food coma. It's, I, I, yeah. Yep, yep. For for those, uh, I, most of our audience is in the U.S., but if you're not, it's the Thanksgiving. We're still in the amount of leftovers and sugar. Oh, God, I, I made my grasshopper pie, so everyone's happy. So Sinister Porpoise, $2. Uh, thank you, Sinister, for the super chat. Thank you uh, for your support. Uh, we always appreciate it. Uh, does this virus count as polymorphic? Um, yes. I don't know. This is why we have other people. <laughs> I have no idea. So let's get to, uh, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to hold on to that until it's, uh, it's a little more appropriate. So, um, uh, gentlemen, uh, we are here to discuss the new variant to hopefully give our audience some idea. There's been a lot of, um, um, sort of panic and, uh, a lot of people getting worried about it. And there are people saying, okay, look, there's probably legit cause to be concerned, but not, not yet cause to panic, run to the hills and, and follow the, 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 the Xandering school of thought on that. So, um, uh, what do we know, and um, uh, what are we looking at with this? Um, I guess, like the, <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead. Um, kind of the scariest thing uh, to think about with this is the fact that we don't have a lot of answers yet. It's very early um, in discovering this virus, and and we're gonna need to take more time to to do research. And I know a lot of us want an answer right now. We want to be able to Google and see what does this mean for me and my family? What does this mean for us uh, in preparation for uh, how to handle this thing? We just, we don't know a lot yet. And um, WHO and the CDC have released a few things recently as Nick was saying, but there's still a lot uh, that we just need to figure out. All right. Well, we do yeah. know that that okay. So there are. Um, oh, did you want to? How much I got? Did you want to pick you off back off of that or? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. I mean, I think in addition to you know the idea that we need to just like wait a little bit. You know, again, this is barely like you know three four days old. I think the folks in South Africa only sounded the alarm maybe a couple of days ago, and already I see, you know, the internet is a buzz with all sorts of wrong and partially right and actually right information. It just seems to be this like absolute whirlwind in terms of things that are being said online. Uh, so I think even at the outset here, we can maybe just tell folks to, you know, let's take a deep breath. You know, we, we need to wait for information to come in. We have some, which we'll talk about over the course of the show, but mm -hmm. you know, let, let's just relax for a second. I think that would do a lot of people a lot of good. What, what is the most wrong thing you've heard so far? Oh God! Well, I mean, if we, if we want to get into that, I think the the most wrong thing I heard so far was just outright conspiracy uh, about how this is all supposed to be a giant distraction from the Ghislaine Maxwell trial, <laughs> which I know is just an insane thought. But you know, scientifically speaking, I'll say the the most wrong thing I've heard so far is uh, uh this was yet another deliberate laboratory release of something to you know make everybody remember that COVID was a thing for vaccine uptake or something. Kind of a again another insane conspiracy theory, but that one's a little bit more science flavored rather than politics. And the U.S. is is um, now reminding people if you haven't gotten your vaccine, uh, they're saying now is is probably the time. Um, I think it's been the time for a while. So um, if if somebody has a YouTube channel and um, they have a co-host who loves guns and and happens to to be a conservative right wing nutcase i mean we're going to use the quotation marks maybe and he wants to head for the hills and you know with his guns is it a little early you think to be making that kind of judgment call <clears throat> Andrew, sorry yeah I, i'd say it's a little early 
I, I'd really say it's early. You know, even even you know, people in rural states. You know, I currently live in the state of Vermont, which is a mostly rural place, and there are people out in uh, what they call the northeastern kingdom, which is probably about as rural as it gets, and they're still getting sick. So, not even the hills will save you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think if if this variant is the reason you want to go out into the hills, it's definitely way too early for that. However, if you have other personal reasons why you just want to leave humanity, I know humanity is rough, and sometimes you just need to not be around people, especially this um, disease is highlighting just how aggravating humanity is. So if that's your reason <laughs> yeah. to leave, I fully support it. Hey, I at least got one support. 50% is pretty good. Fifty. Well, well, uh, uh, you don't know. Twenty-five uh, percent. No, unless you just the three of us, thirty percent, maybe. But okay. But listen, oh, listen. Yeah, I'm all for you. No, no, no. Still fifty percent. I'm. I'm, I'm still all 50% for fifty percent because it's it's me. <laughs> I mean, you can do it if you want. Sure, go I, for listen, it. I, I listen, just don't think I'm it will. I'm all for you bailing and just vanishing for a while. I'm just saying. All right, Native Atheist, five dollars. Uh, thank you, um, Native Atheist. Thank you very much for your support. We we really do appreciate it, and it, it, it helps. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, what do we know now? I, that, now there's a, a, a couple of graphs here, and and um, I'm curious. So uh, okay, before I get to those, so what do we know? There are reasons that there are people who are concerned. What are those reasons? Um, I think the the biggest reason people are concerned is because there's potential that this variant is more easily transmissible. Um, I think that's that's the number one concern that I've been seeing. And of course, we're getting a, an increased number of people testing positive for this, of course. But um, there's a lot of math that still needs to be done determining if this variant specifically um, is more transmissible or if there are other factors involved that are making it seem like it's more transmissible. Um, and then the other concern, uh, the other big concern is whether or not it's more severe than um, other variants of COVID. And we just don't know those things yet. Um, of course, there are other concerns too, but I would love to give our friend here a chance to weigh in on this too. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think you hit it on the head in, in broad strokes. Uh, I think one of the most eye-catching things in this definitely caught a lot of scientists off guard was the sheer volume of mutations in this new variant compared to all the variants prior to this. Uh, I do remember one Christian Anderson of Scripps actually receiving uh, the information about the new mutations in a Slack message, and his response was a simple, holy shit. So, you know... I think at that point, when even the scientists are kind of surprised by the sheer volume of mutations, it's definitely something that uh, researchers are going to pay a hell of a lot of attention to. But at the same time, you know, other scientists have said this throughout the entire pandemic. The sheer number of mutations doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? We have to look at all of these mutations, both individually and in combination. Uh, there's actually a science word, a nerd word for it, called epistasis. Uh, sometimes individual mutations mean nothing, but you put a bunch together and sometimes they create something greater than the sum of their parts. So, you know, I think this, again, underscores the notion that we just have to wait for the data to come out. But, again, going back to what Ben said, a lot of what we do know from other variants that have shared some of the mutations in this, uh, there's a whole lot of not-so-good in there. So, oh. You can reuse over to this. All right, you cut you cut out there for a bit. I don't know if that's just for me or for everybody else, but you did cut out there just at the last ten seconds. Yeah, I missed that a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think again, you know, there, there's a lot of mutations in this that are present in other variants. We we have to see if this particular you know set of mutations, of which there are a lot, uh, actually one repeat the data that we have acquired for other variants before, and two, uh, some of these newer mutations that we've never seen before actually amount to be anything because they might not necessarily mean anything right sheer number of mutations I mean, it just and might be I, a thing and i kind of want to jump in on this point specifically because yeah um there are a lot of mutations and and just like you're saying these a lot of these mutations might not be anything you could have mutations in regions of dna that are non-coding um you could have a, a number of different mutations but then also think about it in this way um there's no intention behind biology. Biology does what it does. And as a virus um, 
invades more hosts and, and it accumulates these mutations, there's nothing to say that they're necessarily going to be beneficial for the virus or, or um, harmful to us. There are a lot of cases where a virus could mutate and it could actually end up being more beneficial to us because it could decrease uh, its transmission, it could decrease uh, its its lethality. Um, and so some of these mutations might be beneficial to us, some of them might be more harmful to us, you just don't know, it's a gamble. And so when um, we've used this tactic to produce vaccines, like that's a way that, that we can make vaccines, um, but in that, this is not a reason to say that we should let more mutations happen because, again, it's it's a toss-up. You could get something that ends up on the off chance not being as bad, or you could get something that is really, really, really bad. So this is not grounds for us to try to cause more mutations or just say, oh, well, some of these mutations are probably nothing, so we should just let them happen. No, we should still take precautions. But... That is to say that the number of mutations does not necessarily mean that every mutation is going to be harmful to us in some way. But the, so and now, if if now presumably there have been a lot of and I, so we're we're already on uh, Omicron and, and there's been well there was some discussion if we've been having new variants for for every letter. But um, there have been a number of variants that we're not able to to be as successful as Delta. So Delta just, uh, the original wild type, now I can't compete with Delta. Delta is is infecting people so much faster that, that, that basically all of the cases now are Delta. So if if it's something that doesn't have an advantage, it ostensibly would not be able to compete with Delta. Is, is, that, is that correct? So we wouldn't really necessarily have to worry about it. Yeah, I think the general consensus is if a virus variant is not any more transmissible than Delta or if it has such profound uh, evasion capabilities with respect to the immune system that it can somehow outpace Delta, you know, those are the two, I guess, like qualities of a variant uh, that have to be involved when you're talking about something that could or could not outcompete Delta. Uh, I think the worrying part about what we know about some of the mutations, uh, it suggests that Omicron might have the capacity to do both uh, I think it's kind of confusing right now in the very early stages, considering there was not all that much Delta in South Africa when Omicron was discovered. However, at the same time, uh, Omicron really has driven itself to dominance in that particular country, a country which also is very much undercounting a lot of the positive cases that are going on right now. Uh, I just encountered some early data on increasing hospitalizations in South Africa. So, you know, that suggests that something is going on. But with that being said, you know, we're just seeing all of these cases pop up in other countries around the world where there is a ton of Delta and it is definitely the dominant one. So we just have to wait and see if Omicron enters a country where Delta is very much in circulation at high levels and is very much dominant, we have to wait and see whether Omicron can truly outcompete it, right? We have to see if all of these mutations add up to something on the epidemiological level. And then something else to consider too with these mutations, um, whether or not we're able to accurately test for these variants is a, is a factor as well. And that's something that people are concerned about um, because the tests uh, screen for very specific structures on the virus, and if you have mutations that would render it unable to to be tested, um, that could skew our data as well for any of these other variants that we don't know about. There could be variants that we just can't even pick up with our test, um, but we, we wouldn't know about it. And it's a scary thing to think about, but it's just something with epidemiology and how we have to do a lot of math to to really figure out what are the causes of these increases in hospitalizations and and the um the rise of these variants but that is a big concern is are we going to be able to detect all of these what is the sensitivity and specificity of tests with regard to these new uh, variants um and then also of course with vaccination how are these mutations going to impact the vaccines that we currently have um, and I'm sure that that's going to spark a, a lot of um, conflict with people who already don't want to get a vaccine. I'm sure a lot of people now are going to say, well, we have these new variants that the vaccine is not even going to work on. It's going to give them a little bit more ammo in that conversation. Yeah, so, and actually, it's really interesting uh, that you brought up the, the testing question. Uh, I actually have the same concern, especially at the rapid tests. Uh, rapid tests look for 
actual proteins from the virus. So if they look different on a molecular level because of mutations, the test might not work right. Thankfully, at least some of the early anecdotal reports suggest that rapid tests seem to be okay. So that's a very good piece of news. Uh, with the PCR testing, which looks for virus genetic material, uh, there's actually a really handy feature, I guess. Uh, this is something that also happened with the Alpha variant. Uh, when people get the, you know, the swab that tests them, where they get their brain poked with a basically a fancy Q-tip, uh, that swab goes through a testing process that tries to find the genetic material and actually, you know, detect it in a fancy machine. When that happens, they're looking for three different pieces of the virus's genetic code. Uh, because of the mutations in the spike protein uh, in Alpha and in Omicron, however, uh, the area where they're looking for in the spike protein actually tests negative because a mutation screws up the test, uh, whereas the other two areas test positive. So it's actually very easy uh, with PCR testing to identify Omicron because Alpha has pretty much been outcompeted by Delta. It's like non-existent anymore. And now with Omicron, the same phenomenon of what's being called spike protein dropout, uh, it's happening again with Omicron. So you can actually rapidly assess the true numbers of Omicron if you're testing enough because you only test positive for two out of the three regions of the virus's genetic code. And you don't have to send that person sample for the longer, more expensive full genetic sequencing test. So we actually have an advantage in detection here, and I really hope that we increase the amount of testing to take advantage of that feature. And can I, can I shameless plug here please, for a sec? Please. A lot of the terminology that we're talking about, I'm doing a series on my channel right now about intro to epidemiology. So if you want to know more about how we determine if a test is reliable, how we do these calculations, um, I specifically use the COVID rapid test as one of my examples, uh, you should tune into that series because I, I do cover a lot of these terms. And what we're going to do is... Um we already have i didn't have your channel before this so i have your name there but i don't have the the channel put in your uh, channel will be in the description before the end of the show and we've already dropped it in the live chat we'll be dropping it again uh shortly so um so um almost i go the problem with testing as i understand it is the more you test the more likely you are to get positive covid results and that can be a problem at least according to certain former presidents of this country um <laughs> Isn't it true yeah, so that I mean, testing yeah. leads to more positive results? Yes. Well, I mean, Done. To an um, extent. Like it's it, over. To, it's over. Thank <laughs> you for playing. I mean, you know, it depends on how, how, A, how much you test. I mean, you can scale it up, but you might not necessarily be capturing the entire populace that you want to test. Um, in theory, you know, if, if we're talking about a virus that has a certain case positivity rate, let's say for the Delta variant, you know, out of all COVID tests that are done, say maybe 5% come back positive. I'm just, that's a hypothetical number. Um, if we're dealing with something more transmissible, like potentially Omicron, uh, you might see that number actually go up. So if you expand tests, you might kind of get more positives, but that might not be a function of testing. That just simply might be a function of the virus's biology and how transmissible in comparison to other variants it may be. And I was also going to point out that, um, I mean, no matter what, the more you test, the more positives you are going to get, but then you'd have to go through and correct for which ones are false positives, uh, which with a lot of the COVID tests, we're not really worried about false positives. They seem to be um, not as sensitive as they are specific. Uh, so you're more likely to get false negatives, but either way, the more testing you do, the more likely you are to get false positives as well. So I, I really probably shouldn't joke, but it's an old. I mean, it's just when Trump gave that line, I'm I'm still a little bitter ab about that. Um, of course, we're getting more fair. positive. We're testing more. Oh dear Lord, no, 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 boy. Uh, oh dear Lord. All right. Any proof? Proof positive that if you want to get rid of COVID, just stop testing for it. <laughs> stop It'll testing. go away magically. Uh, you close your Lord. eyes. If you can't see it, it's not there. Hey, That's yeah, how it yeah, works. Exactly. So um. Uh, a lot of countries are taking this seriously. Uh, now, uh, one of the reasons, so um, we now have two countries uh, that, are, that are, are completely closing their borders. Israel has already closed their borders. Uh, Morocco is going to be closing their borders on Monday. Um, now, some of the data that, that has them concerned, and I, I want to stress this one. Now, when we first started covering COVID, 
uh, the initial data showed about a 5% mortality rate, 5%. Um, it's now down to, if I, if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly, it's down closer to about 1%. So uh, that's a, that's a time has, has dramatically changed that number. So this is extraordinarily early, but this is one of the ones that, that, that we saw, one of the graphs that we saw floating around. Um, now this is just from a very small um, uh, sample pool, and you can see there is the um, uh, the yellow bar there. That was the um, I think the the original wild type. Delta has a 70% um, uh, viral competitive advantage, and just in uh, the the a very initial sample, which is you can't do much with. Um, uh, you see you see that huge the uh, the 500%. Uh, uh, there and put another way. We're going to put this graph up here. So um, if this were to hold, uh, this would obviously be be uh, quite staggering. Uh, we don't know. This is still very early, but I think it's th this initial data that's got people so concerned. So can you tell us? Um, uh, is is it just the mutations that have them, uh, have uh, countries concerned? Are they overreacting? Uh, Boris Johnson said, "Quote: I, I I must stress this with a new variant. There are many things we cannot just know." Uh, we just cannot know at this early stage. Our scientists are learning more uh, hour by hour. It does appear that Omicron spreads, spreads very rapidly and uh, can be spread between people who are double vaccinated. This is also a very extensive mutation, which means it diverges quite significantly from previous configurations of the virus. And as a result, it um, uh, might in part reduce the protection of our vaccines over time. So uh, that's what uh, uh, Boris Johnson said. Uh, do you think that these measures are wise, uh, precautionary measures, overreactionary. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I hear Boris Johnson taking measures, and those things usually don't go together in the same <laughs> sentence because the man's insane. So, you know, I, I would say whatever measures they're taking in the UK, they probably need to multiply them by like two or three. I mean, look, there, there's truth in what he said. You know, we're, we're trying to actually learn more right now. I think from, from my perspective, I would love to see what most people would describe as an overreaction, simply because if you overreact and the problem is contained, or it's not as bad as it otherwise could have been, I would call that, you know, a hands down a success. I would rather us be on that end of the spectrum than not having done enough and allowing the new Omicron variant to possibly continue to spread and, and make people sick and kill them. Uh, but again, you know, with the with respect to the data you put on screen, I would, again, be very cautious about using that to sort of interpret the direction we're going in, simply because those numbers are as staggering as they are because we're dealing with a much smaller number of cases. I think that first one in particular uh, that was looking at the you know, total representativeness of all cases described in the early stages of the variance emergence you know we don't have all that many cases going on in south africa in terms of the absolute number so of course the new variant is going to and, and i think and, all that being said we just need to you know wait and actually get more data to see how true those numbers actually are and and to the best of we right now to the best of our understanding the delta variant is underreported in south africa which would cause those numbers to skew would it not because you would you would uh you're comparing it to to a a falsely low sample of how much uh, delta has actually penetrated into the country would that be roughly accurate yeah, I mean that that's possible. No, I can't, you know, okay. reach into my crystal ball and say that, you know, I know exactly how much delta is in South Africa. But, you know, if delta is underreported, how much is Omicron underreported? That's the question that I want to know the answer mm -hmm. to. But this is just a point to be made that like you you can't just go online and find these numbers and find these graphs and then make determinations based on them. I do think that we need to take precautions and and I agree that like these countries should probably be taking more uh, extreme precautions just until we know more. But this is why we need to understand statistics and understand epidemiology before we make these calls, because you could pull up a study like that and say, OK, yeah, I have this graph that shows um, this staggering increase in cases. But then as we're applying context to it here um, with reporting of cases and, and factors that would skew the numbers, it puts things into a, a more realistic perspective. So don't just find something and run with it. Use your critical thinking, and especially in this community of people where we are supporting skepticism. Make sure that you are putting things into context, that you understand how to read the data, and um, that you're. if you don't know how to read it, talk to somebody who does. Um, I do think we need the precautions, but absolutely, like this is a, a great example of, of why we need to be careful about what we read. 
Uh, is Andr is Andring any thoughts? Are you? Uh, he 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 may be in the hills by this point. I don't know. I mean, he's he's fast. He's fast. <laughs> well, I'm I am in the hills, but so I guess my my kind of question is is you know it seems like when things pop out like this, and you actually start getting enough information to say okay, this could be concern. It seems like it's already too late to have. Uh, mm -hmm. To, to put restrictions in, it's like when you have the benefit of hindsight, you can say, oh, yeah, well, we, they should have you know, put restrictions in at, at such and such a time. Yet when they wanted you to put the restrictions in place, there wasn't any real compelling evidence to support those restrictions. And a lot of these restrictions do have other externalities. They do have other effects, and a lot of them can be negative as well. You know, there's a lot of people stranded. You know, closing down your borders mm -hmm. like that can have a, a profound impact on things like your supply chain and... Uh, your economy as a whole. Um, I mean, how do you go about trying to to balance that? I mean, I, I can understand, you know, from like a an epidemiology standpoint, saying, "Hey, look, any of this is really bad." But when we look at the totality of of you know COVID that we've had so far, you know, the variants that we've had so far, you know, at at what point do you kind of jump and say, "Okay, well, we're going to risk you know harm to to people." You know, because these these are uh, restrictions and these uh, measures that that we take do cause harm in other areas, which I I think is often overlooked. I mean, you can't just shut down a country like that. You know, all travel in and out like what what uh, Jerusalem or uh, Israel has done, without other consequences. Uh, so, at what point do you think you know we really should be saying, okay, we need to act strongly and quickly now, versus we need more data. Of course, waiting for more data tends to put you more at risk of it having already spread before you can get a chance to, to really do anything about it. Yeah, well, I mean, at least from my perspective, you know, if the first thing we're doing is travel bans, uh, I think as Peter Hotez, uh, a virologist, uh, said a couple of days ago, uh, by the time you're trying to get around to doing a travel ban, it's probably already too late, uh, especially because uh, the U.S. has only banned a handful of countries uh, ban travel from a handful of countries, rather, uh, where Omicron has been detected. You know, I think there's a whole list of you know, 12, now 13 countries, I think, including Canada as of today, uh, where travel between those localities and the U.S. is entirely unimpeded. So I think uh, travel bans might not necessarily be the best like measure, but you know, even pre-Omicron, right, Delta's still around, waning immunity has been a thing, people were needing to get boosters, and we're actually in the middle of a surge, even pre-Omicron, of Delta again, uh, because of that, so we can still talk about the restrictions that, or the you know, restrictions and safety measures that we've had the entire time: mask wearing, social distancing, ventilation. Like the these things have never gone away, and they should have continued to be implemented and only strengthened further as the pandemic continued to drag on. Because all of those apply just as much to Omicron as it does to any other variant. Yeah. So Oh, yeah, I, I guess it is very difficult to it's very difficult to make that kind of call because yeah you're you're right in that there's a cost no matter what we do um it it makes me very frustrated that people have stopped taking it as seriously as they were and people have stopped the mask wearing stopped um supporting vaccination and, and the small things like people have stopped doing the small things um and then are worried about the big things that we're, we're going to need to do because a lot of people stop doing the small things. Uh, so, yeah, there's going to be a cost, but it, it's difficult. How do we how do we get people on board to to try to stop this or do, or do we just let it go? If you gentlemen could uh, put one policy, make one policy law, just a, just one basic masks. Um, um, uh, what is it? Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Um, uh, uh, shutting down international travel, um, and we'll we'll say we'll put just take off the off the uh, um, the table. We'll put down like an entire sort of a, a nationwide uh, mandate, uh, maybe forced vaccines. If you could make one policy, one thing that you think would have the most impact that we could all do, what would that be? Yeah, if vaccines aren't on the table, I would say mandatory ventilation improvements for every single locality, schools, jobs, hospitals, you name it. Because, but, again, no, we're dealing with something are, that's trained. Not, 
Sorry, I'm sorry. Vaccines are oh, on the table, oh. just not 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 lockdowns. I'm sorry, I may have not like a locking down the entire country, but short of that, forcing everyone got to get it, a vaccine, it. forcing everyone to wear a mask, forcing people to uh, not travel internationally. What's the one? What's the or uh, what's the one thing you can each think of that would be a policy that you, in your ideal world would have the most positive impact? Yeah, sorry about that. Now, if vaccines are on the table, then my answer changes to vaccines, with ventilation being a very close second. Uh, you know, vaccines, regardless of variant, keep people alive. When you've had a, um, three doses now, we've determined this with actual research data. So, you know, I think at that point, it's safe, it's effective, at least in the United States. There's ample supply. I think there's really no reason not to actually mandate it for folks and then let the cards fall where they fall. Do you think they should be um, uh, added to, say, MMR or a, a kind of regimen like that where they are essentially required for going to school? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think school, even jobs, especially if you work in medicine in some capacity, whether you're a physician, uh, nurse, you know, administrative staff, regardless of your role in the medical system, you know, anybody who participates in it should be vaccinated, um, aside from patients who might be coming in to, you know, do just that, get their vaccine. But again, I think vaccines have the most positive impact in terms of saving life. I think that's been one of the priorities that has fallen by the wayside, unfortunately, during this pandemic is actually keeping people alive and trying to help the unvaccinated get vaccines that they themselves might continue to enjoy life. Even if people think they're an unsavory bunch, they still deserve to live. Dr. Ben? Yeah, and I, I, think, I, would ag I think I would agree with um, how important vaccines are. Of course, yeah, I, I don't think we should be able to force everybody to get a vaccine. We shouldn't tie people down and vaccinate them. But I right. do think people should have social consequences if they don't get vaccines. Like, um, yeah, jobs should be refusing people who don't have vaccines, or especially if you work in healthcare, you should be working in healthcare and not have a vaccine. Like, schools should be encouraging vaccines. Like, having social consequences for people who don't get the vaccine, I think, is appropriate. At least in, in terms of short-term goals, I think the vaccine is, is where I would be heading. But um, if I could change something that's more of a long-term goal uh, that would prevent things like this happening in the future. I want to fix education. I want to remove some of these paywalls, like let people have access to real information so they don't go looking for um, <laughs> these, this awful pseudoscience because that's all they have access to. I want people to learn how to read studies, learn how to interpret data, like just fix the way we teach people about this because I think really um, the thing that's going to help is is knowledge. Like knowledge is power, and I think that's going to. If if we could have the ability to educate people on these issues, then that could do a whole lot for us. Uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> I, I was going to make a joke, but I just realized I'd be playing into, and I, I want to try to keep some of the, the false information stuff out. I, yeah, all right. Um, so. I don't know. Uh, is Andrew any, any any other thoughts? Uh, I guess one of my kind of questions, because I've I've heard this argument kind of being made a little bit more recently, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with you know COVID fatigue. You know, uh, I drive across the country, and the 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 few places that still have mask mandates, like statewide, like Washington State has a you know statewide mask mandate, and if you go into some of the larger cities. You know, you'll see those enforced, but as soon as you start getting out to more rural locations, they're not enforced at all. Um, and, I, and I see that as kind of being, you know, people are just kind of tired of this. Uh, you know, and I see other people making arguments like, well, look, tuberculosis kills more people per year than, uh, than COVID does. And yet we don't see a huge, you know, pushback against tuberculosis so much. Uh, of course, I think that's mainly because tuberculosis isn't much of a problem in first world nations. It's most, mostly in the third world nations that you see lots of tuberculosis problems, but we have complete you know, treatments for tuberculosis. And yet we don't see the huge outrage or the huge push you know, to try and, and get people vaccinated or you know, concerned about things like tuberculosis. Uh, what, you know, what do you tell people that are just getting tired of this don't think that it's much of a, a, an issue that it doesn't have a high enough death rate and that, you know, there's plenty of other diseases out there that we're not, you know, mandating against that are more dangerous than COVID is. I mean, well, how do you, how do you get them on board? 
I mean, my my first go to when I hear folks who are talking about the you know the survival rate and uh, the fact that you know I think you know the case fatality rate varies you know between one and two percent depending on where you're talking about for COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, I, I would encourage them to look at things in a less binary way. You know, life and death aren't the only two things. You know, there's a lot of things that happen in between. I think as we all know and. Uh, you know, again, one of the things that has been not talked about throughout this entire pandemic is long COVID, right? Even if you happen to get COVID and you live to tell the tale, it doesn't mean your quality of life is going to be very good. There's a very real possibility that you could have semi-permanent or permanent symptoms. And science is, of course, trying to understand this uh, to the best of its ability, depending on the research group. But there's still a lot that is not unknown unknown about long COVID, about uh, being a long hauler. So, you know, if you're interested in, you know, making it through the pandemic with A, being alive and B, having a good quality of life, uh, vaccines are actually a really good way to try and reduce your risk of that happening to you. Uh, it's really one of the only things you can do along with, you know, masking, distancing, uh, improving ventilation, stuff like that. But on the individual level, you know, look, I think people are interested in living long, fulfilling lives, whatever they want to do. And if you have long COVID, that is going to be a very major obstacle. You might not be able to breathe. You'll have chronic brain fog. You won't be able to necessarily think right. You know, life will be different for you you'll be disabled possibly in the scope of the American healthcare system, which is going to be incredibly expensive. So I think at that point, uh, you know, I really want people to think about more than just death. Death is not the only outcome from COVID-19 if you happen to be unlucky enough to catch the virus. Um, and uh, so, a long, long haul, I just, uh, real quick, a long haul, uh, I last heard that's about 30%. Is that accurate that the estimates are now as many as, as 30% of people who've had COVID experience some form of long haul uh, up to six months after the fact? Is that is that about right? It really depends on the study. I mean, there are a lot of variable estimates. I've seen reports as high as 40%. I think there is a study out of Japan that said even, you know, 40% of people who had asymptomatic infection, you know, the most mild form of it, were still having uh, some sort of complication even after the fact, which is a really wild thought when you think about it. So I think, you know, there's still conflicting pieces of data just to underscore how much we still don't know and how you know, the definitions of some of these st studies might actually muddy the waters a bit. But yeah, somewhere around 30 to 40 ish percent. I think the number, the true number might lie somewhere in there. But even then, even if it's half of that, that's still way too high. I would say that's societally unacceptable and we should do something about that. Yes, Dr. Ben. So my, my thought, like I absolutely 100% co-sign with everything that was, was just said. Um, I want to add something that I've been um, debating with a lot of people online about, and that is this idea that the people who are being hospitalized and dying from COVID are all comorbid in some way. They're either obese or have chronic disease. And there are a few like fallacies at play here. I've seen people making black swan fallacies, people who work in hospitals saying, well, I haven't seen someone without a com comorbidity die of COVID. Like, okay, you and your location haven't look at the studies of comparing all these different areas, the different hospitals, because your area might not be um, encompassing everyone out there. But then also think about like putting these studies into context as well. Um, if you think about America as a whole, uh, and especially certain areas of the country more so than others, the majority of people are comorbid. So of course, more people who have these complications are gonna report as having more comorbidities because the majority of people um, have some kind of chronic disease or have some kind of condition that would put them in and being a, at a higher risk. So of course you look at the data and say, well, okay, the majority of the people who died had this. Well, most people have some kind of risk factor. Um, so, but that's not to say that people who don't have those risk factors won't be sick and die. We've, we've seen children, um, uh, an increase in child morbidity, mortality from these. So I think if there was a way to communicate with people that it's not just certain people, like people have this, this weird um, thought that they're somehow immune to what's going on. Like, oh, this affects other people. This isn't affecting me. But you just don't, you just don't know. And I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to take this direction with my channel to, to encourage people understanding the complexity and the, the nuance and the context uh, of these. But it's very difficult to communicate when, when someone doesn't, isn't able to really put it into context like that.
All right, we have a $2 super chat from Sinister Porpoise. Using go-tos is bad practice. I approve of binary. Um, thank you, thank you, Sinister. Uh, I think Sinister would prefer a go sub. Um, thank you very much for the for the super chat. It's been a while for go tos and go subs, but at any rate, uh, thank you very much for your support, Sinister, as always. Um, so uh, I let's see. There's a couple of things then I want to get to. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, could I could I would quickly just go over some of the the range in in in. Um, uh, symptoms of long haul because there's 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 been a lot of them from from sort of kidney issues to to brain fog so what are what are this uh, some of the symptoms and how much are, is right now anecdotal and how much do we actually understand at this point Oof. i mean <clears throat> off the top of my head you no know, i think it really depends on again the definition you used of, as long haul i think the most commonly used definition that i've seen is any symptom that lasts for longer than one month after you test negative. And that's ranged from everything to cough, difficulty breathing, chronic brain fog, uh, you know, elevated liver enzymes, kidney issues, like you said, uh, reproductive dysfunction, particularly in men with uh, chronic erectile dysfunction. That's actually a big one. Um, I mean, you name it. You, you could talk about pretty much every body system and I think, Ben, you could probably add on to this here, but you can name any, any body system and find a symptom for it with long hauling. Yeah, I mean, just with the receptors uh, that, that COVID binds to, um, it, it's a systemic thing. Like, your whole body's going to be affected. Um, but the, the thing with people reporting these um, long COVID symptoms, some of them, um, like you said, liver, uh, liver enzymes, uh, kidney function, Things like that can be measured. Those are measurable effects that, that we can determine whether or not you have certain criteria. However, things like brain fog is very subjective. Um, feelings of shortness of breath is very subjective. We can't measure that. We can't quantify it. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say whether or not someone does meet criteria. And I wonder if they're... I haven't seen any specific, like sets of criteria that they're saying yes this this qualifies as long covid um but with being such a mix of subjective and, and objective uh, data it, it's kind of hard to say who really has it and who doesn't <laughs> yeah well, i think that also underscores the importance of listening to patients you know because at the same time you know they only have subjective things to report. You know, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. you know, presenting to a clinic with measures of their kidney and liver function and saying, do <laughs> I meet some sort of criteria? You know, they're just simply reporting what they feel in their body and, and what's Absolutely. going on. So, you know, I, I think it underscores the importance of actually trying to get an accurate definition so that way we can try and understand the true prevalence of this while at the same time, you know, not allowing some of the folks who have always had some comorbidities going on allow themselves to say they've had long covid now even if they never necessarily had it you know there's definitely an aspect of that too where people kind of hop on the long covid train but i would say there's certainly more true genuine long haulers than people doing that All right, oh, for so, sure definitely so i can think of three three problems that um, when somebody sits there and says hey i'm a, a healthy person i'm reasonably young early 20s uh early to mid 30s um I don't need to get a vaccine. It's not going to be that big a deal. I'm not in a group that, that is really going to necessarily suffer. So I can think of three things that they are not considering when they talk about just, oh, I might die from COVID. So the first is long haul. They could get long haul. And uh, we, we know for a fact it's a thing. But we, we obviously have a, um, uh, we're, we're varying in, in how serious it is, but it does range in a variety of serious symptoms. Uh, uh, for uh, any number of people who get it. So that is definitely a thing that you could also get that people aren't uh, taking into account. Uh, another one is uh, the uh, overall death rate as a result of the strain on the medical uh, system. So we actually have uh, the New York Times is the only organization that I'm aware of that made a serious attempt to find out how many people have actually died as a result of the pandemic. This includes when people had a 12 hour wait in uh, the uh, uh, Dallas. Yeah, if they were trying to get to the uh, Dallas hospital, you uh, had a heart attack. It was a 12 hour wait at the ER to to see a doctor. So that is someone you could say did not die of COVID, but did die uh, of the pandemic and uh, hospital services that were not available and otherwise would be. Do we have any idea how bad that is right now in this country and, and worldwide and what, what those losses look like at this, at this point? 
I don't have numbers, uh, but I do have examples of um, where where this happens. Uh, for example, people who should be in the ICU who are not in the ICU, they can't get a spot in the ICU because they're full. Uh, so you put somebody on the floor, and there are a few very big differences between being in the ICU and being on the floor. Like, sure, they're both in the hospital, uh, but when you're in the ICU, uh, the the doors and the windows, like all are, they're usually transparent. Um, they're, it's usually a small area. So you have nurses um, in the vicinity, you have doctors always on call or in the vicinity ready to act if something happens. Um, they have equipment uh, reserved in that area for, for people to use. You have a lot at your disposal if you're in the ICU. Uh, they are prepared for if something is to happen that they can step in right away, take care of it. And that response time matters. Uh, you take somebody to the floor um, who, let's say, uh, is high risk for uh, an emergency. Their their door and their their walls are opaque. You can't see through them. Um, if someone were to walk by and you were to like pass out in there, no one no one would know necessarily. Um, the hallways spread out. You have so many more rooms, more patients per nurse, more patients per doctor. They're all over the place. So if something were to happen, um, they're going to have to go a longer distance to come to your room to help you. Um, they don't have as many people ready to help you. You don't have as much equipment there to help you. So even though you're in the hospital, your location matters. So the fact that we are filling these ICU rooms is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And I don't think anyone wants to find themselves in there, but that's something that you wouldn't know unless you were in a hospital setting and understood how that worked. And I think, I think it's actually... useful to point out um, that w when you're referring to, you know, putting people on the floor, you're not literally meaning oh, yeah. putting them on the floor in the bed. The, the, the general admittance rooms are considered the floor. Yeah, the, the med medical the surgical floor. floor. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a relevant uh, the distinction. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think to, to add some actual numbers onto this, the, the CDC at least makes an attempt to track the amount of excess deaths caused uh, as a function of the pandemic in the country. I think that uh, would certainly encompass all of the excess deaths caused by increased strain on the medical system. Uh, so they do have a dashboard uh, where they at least attempt to tabulate this, and you can take a look at the intimate details of their, their methods and everything. But uh, just looking at total absolute number of predicted excess deaths since February of 2020, uh, they clock it in at just a shade under 890,000. So uh, just to put everything that uh, Ben said into a sort of larger numerical perspective, uh, we have definitely had a very large toll taken on us. Jesus, I, I, I knew it was going to be high. I didn't think it was going to be that high. Um, That's a, more than, a little bit more than double the current uh, COVID death toll, surprisingly. Yeah, I mean, so, that actually makes me wonder if they're including COVID deaths in that uh, and they're just mm -hmm. adding the excess on top. But you know, let me let me comb through their methodology a little bit. I can link this uh, if if you're interested in actually looking at it. Or, or uh, give it to me. We can uh, add it to the um, description down at the bottom. And if anybody else has any data, you can always put it in the comments. Uh, we read all our comments. Uh, let us know. Uh, drop something in the comments. We'll get back to you, and I, I can pass that along. But yeah, if you give that to me, we'll put job. it in the description. So um, let's see. The um, so we covered the. Uh, uh, the increase in fatalities, not directly related to COVID, but uh, from uh, having to deal with the strain of the pandemic, we've dealt with a uh, long haul. And uh, one other uh, problem that people don't think about when they say, well, gee, should I uh, wear masks or not? Should I take this seriously or, or, or not? Which is why we're here, mutations. What's the likelihood of a mutation as, as more and more people get infected? Oof, I mean, that that's a very much a question of biology. You know, I think uh, and this is probably getting into a little bit too much in terms of the, the actual molecular biology of the virus, but uh, mutations are a function of a couple of things. The, the first one being uh, the actual enzyme that makes a literal copy of the virus's genetic code, so it can be stuck into a new viral particle and then go on to infect another cell, rinse and repeat the process. Uh, the question is, how good of a job does that do in terms of does it make any errors or does it you know, copy everything exactly? You, know, you can think about it like a Xerox machine. You know, When you put something into a copier, you expect it to be a 100% picture-perfect carbon copy. Uh, you know, Maybe imagine if, you know, 
every third word there happened to be a letter change in a particular sentence of the document you were printing. Maybe that's just a feature of the Xerox machine. You know, if you want to think about that uh, in terms of what's going on in the actual virus's life cycle, uh, that's kind of what governs the ability to actually copy its genetic code, either one-to-one -one or with some errors. Uh, on top of that, the virus actually expresses um, a proofreading enzyme. So basically, you imagine if you had your copier, your Xerox machine again, uh, you printed it out, you noticed it had a couple of errors, and then you could you know, press a button, and it would suck the paper right back in and then fix them and spit it right back out. You know, the, the virus has that functionality, I think, is the, the point I'm trying to make. So really, it just depends on the virus. And the higher order point to be made here is we don't have you know fixed numbers you know you can't really say you know in any given covid case x person has x percent chance of having their virus mutate uh, what we do know is that if the virus can infect immunocompromised people uh, there's a much higher likelihood of that happening simply because their immune system cannot fight off the virus uh, this is the leading theory about how variants emerge in the first place is that a virus happen to get into an immunocompromised person and infect them chronically over months and months and months, uh, having free reign, mutating at random, and then something that just happens to be evolutionarily advantageous then suddenly goes on from that immunocompromised person, spreads, and becomes a new variant. So it's a function of the virus's biology, but also of how much we allow the virus to spread. If we don't want it to happen, we stop the virus from spreading. You know, I think this is a message that has definitely been shouted from the rooftop since the start of the pandemic, and unfortunately, I think goes ignored by the uh, political class more often than not. All right, so I've dropped uh, your link. Thank you. That's the CDC. They have a separate... Um, uh, I dropped that uh, link in the live chat, so thank you for that. And then, um, as somebody said this, I did want to cover this. I, I missed this one. So this is, um, I guess, the Omicron variant has 42 mutations uh, over the previous variant. How many mutations are you used to seeing? What's a, what's an average number, and why is this so much higher than that? I mean, I think with Delta, you know, it, I don't remember the exact number, but it was maybe, you know, 10, 11 at most. I think it was actually single digits in terms of mutations in the spike protein. Uh, I think in total, you know, as that chatter said, there's, you know, 40 something uh, mutations. I think I counted, um, I think it might be closer to 50, actually. I counted 18 in genes that are not the spike protein, in addition to, you know, the 30 something in the spike protein. So, mm -hmm. you know, all that to say, just the sheer volume is way higher than any variant that I've seen. Um, actually, like, categorized in significant detail with a full genetic sequence at any point during COVID. And that, again, I think speaks to the idea that these variants come from immunocompromised people. If a virus is replicating for months in one person, it can accumulate mutation after mutation after mutation. And it just is kind of like a snowball rolling down the hill. Once it reaches a big enough mass, it'll actually start causing some issues as it goes down the hill. And that's what's happening now, I think. And there's no guarantee we're going to get, like, I mean, we could get two new mutations at, at the same time. I mean, so far it's been sort of one at a time that we're worried about, you know, but we could next week have a brand new one as well. It's just a numbers game. Yeah, I mean, theoretically that's possible. In reality, you know, who knows how likely that actually is. I think that makes it really difficult and kind of uncertain for a lot of people as they're trying to follow the pandemic, right? You know, we can't really ascertain the likelihood that, that the virus will do a certain thing in terms of its biology or infect a certain person who might not have an immune system to fight it off. You know, it's just a matter of we can try to contain it and hopefully maybe possibly eradicate it if it ever gets to that point in the next decade and hope for the best. And if we try harder, we can get closer to that reality even if we don't reach it, making it less likely we'll get a mutation. All right, Speaking Xander, of, of trying yes. to do that, yes, yeah, it's, it, it, I was wondering, you know, do you think that it's a, a realistic goal to try and eliminate COVID, or is this going to be a, an endemic virus, much like rhinovirus and influenza? It's going to be here. It's going to have lots of mutations, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Or, it, you know, is it realistic to try and, you know, eliminate the virus? I mean, I think the answer is both. You know, I think in terms of actually eliminating it from the face of the planet, that's going to be really difficult because it has animal reservoirs both in uh, you know the wilderness around China and Southeast Asia. You know, bats, uh, raccoon dogs, all sorts of different animals that are you know factory farm there for fur and meat. Uh, but also in North America, you know, the white-tailed deer, uh, mice all around the world. Um, there are plenty of animal reservoirs where the virus actually is right now. So it's going to make it really difficult to. Um, you know, actually get rid of it for a very long time. But 
all of the same things we would do to get rid of it are the same things that we would do to try and reduce transmission and reduce the burden the virus has on everybody. Uh, again, mask wearing, distancing, vaccination. The more places a virus has to go and spread, the greater the likelihood that it could mutate and become a new variant. So if we just simply create more and more dead ends with the virus, even just restricting it to animals, that's going to do society a very big favor. But that also underscores the importance of surveillance and early warning detection systems when we're trying to look to see what's going on in the animal reservoirs, just like what they were doing at the Wuhan Institute of Virology before this even started. That's precisely the kind of science they were doing, trying to discover how many viruses were truly lurking in the wilderness that could come out to get us one day, like today. Yeah, I think with with as many variants as we have and um, how we've kind of let this thing keep going, I, I think it's going to be with us for a long time. I, I think it, it might end up being where we, we're going to have to get vaccines every so often for the, the strains that are more likely to be seen during the year, kind of like we do with influenza. Um, I feel like we kind of missed our window with our opportunity to, and I don't even know if we had that opportunity to really eradicate it. Like, of course, um, like you were saying, we, we can't get rid of the animal reservoirs. Um, but our chances of really eradicating it in humans, I think have kind of passed and we're going to have to live with it now. But that being said, again, we need to make the most of this and try not to just let it spiral even more out of control. Cause who knows what these mutations are going to do further down the line. They might be less harmful, but they might be more harmful. So yeah, wear a mask, get vaccinated, try to keep distancing, um, try not to travel to certain places. Like the same things that we've already been doing are, are what we keep, need to keep doing. So I, I normally hate saying this, but because it's often misused. But so what you're saying is, is to avoid the future of Songbird, we really should be diligent in the easy, semi. Um, effective, I hate to say semi-effective, fairly effective methods of controlling the spread and trying to reduce the spread as much as possible, even if it's not a completely realistic goal to completely eliminate it, at least not in the, in the near term. Yeah, I mean, we should absolutely yeah. be doing as much as we can constantly. I mean, I think, you know, the Oh, there, there's an old adage for this. I think it was uh, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, right? We, we should always be you know, on top of everything, trying to do everything we can to not only reduce the spread, but also prevent this from happening again. So I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. You have not met the average American voter. Is Andering, um, any final <laughs> thoughts? I, I try to not have final thoughts because I would like to believe I'm going to be here tomorrow to have more oh, thoughts. For so. fuck's sake. I thought the jokes in our live chat were oh, bad. No, I'm, I, I, I want to go back to the solipsist jokes. They, they are better than the, the, the equivocation on, you know, dear Lord. I, I guess my final thoughts uh, for, for the topic, at least for the show, would, would be, you know, it sounds like we need to keep vigilant as much as you know we're, we're kind of fatiguing about a lot of these policies that you know there's quite a few uh, other effects and and consequences to the virus besides just simply dying that we'd like to try and avoid and about the only way we're going to do that is if people actually get vigilant and 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 keep up with the the policies and I'm, I'm not seeing that as i travel around the country I, i'm seeing a lot of fatigue a lot of people just brushing it all off so I'm not sure how you know, optimistic I am that we'll, we'll be able to keep up the kind of vigilance needed to, to really be effective in stopping uh, more variants and continuing to have endemic problems with the, the virus. But maybe we'll get there. Well, I do think we need to have a show on because I think the answer to that is sort of what Dr. Ben said earlier. It's about education. Uh, but there's also a huge uh, portion of the population that does not wish to be educated on this topic. And if for no other reason than just saying we're going to educate you implies a deficit. It's the deficit model of communication. It's the, you know, we're going to teach you how to write your caveman ways and they don't want to hear that. On the flip side, um, that's not a reason to go around killing people. <laughs> 
or, or to go around dying. And it's 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 getting to the point where, I mean, it's, it's already past the point where, you know, I mean, if you're walking around uh, without a mask on and you sneeze or cough or, or somehow infect somebody who is either immunocompromised or, you know, you're directly contributing to their death. I mean, it's it's this is this is not a game. So I don't know um, it, how, how you educate people who don't don't wish to be educated, at least in the way that we're talking about. I, I, we, that's an interesting topic to discuss, so maybe we should uh, look into that. So, um, student Dr. Ben, uh, any final thoughts and, and tell people where they can find you, although your your ch YouTube channel is now in the description, um, but uh, uh, tell, tell us where we can find you and any final thoughts you have about COVID or this topic or... or um, or about Maya, she's she's. I think she's upset that you haven't said hello to her or said uh, you know because she's in there like she's pining over you. But okay, fine. I'm hi Maya. Good to see you, Maya. Uh, I don't have a lot of like final thoughts. I think I've said pretty much everything I wanted to say on the topic. Uh, but you can find me um, on YouTube at Student Doctor Ben. You can also find me on Twitch at Student Doctor Ben. Um, my my Twitch is less formal, so all my formal like actual educational stuff is on YouTube. That's the important place you need to be. Uh, I talk about science. I talk about uh, social issues and that kind of thing. So that's where you can find me. All right. And homozygote, any final thoughts? And when we have a link to your Twitch uh, down below, tell us a little bit um, about where people can find you and final thoughts on the, on the topic. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much. I think as far as final thoughts are concerned, uh, you know, even prior to Omicron, you know, people's immunity has been uh, wearing off. The scientific data has proved this much across all vaccines. This is simply a feature. Uh, at this point, if it has been six months since your second dose, you need a third. It has been approved for all adults, according to the CDC and the FDA. So please go get your boosters, especially if Omicron is going to become a thing that is going to give you the best protection available against Omicron and any future variants that might happen to emerge down the line. Uh, trust me, it's something you want to do for yourself, your family, and for those in your community. Uh, you can go ahead and find me at... Uh, twitch.tv slash homozygote or as uh, one of my viewers bought me the URL accurate shitposting.science I do actually like to uh, joke around a lot yeah. invoke a little bit of gallows humor to help me cope with COVID hell world that we seem to be living in so I think that URL is actually pretty accurate but um, yeah I'll teach you a little bit about uh, some molecular biology and how scientists go about doing science you, know, you can get a little bit more insight into the process of you know how we learn about things like COVID uh, among other things uh, and thank you again very much for having me on the show Oh, thank you, sir. So, uh, uh, Titan, uh, quote, C Zygote, I told you YouTube was better. Yes, sir, it is. So, um, thank you both uh, for coming, <laughs> and I hope you both will come back. I think um, we wanted to do this because it's it's uh, been in the news now, and uh, still a number of people haven't heard of it. A number of people have seen a lot of stuff on Twitter, and it's it's getting a little a little crazy, as uh, Homo Zygote pointed out. So, thank you uh, for coming on such short notice to discuss something that is literally, you know, 24, 48 hours old. We really appreciate that. We would like to have both of you back uh, once, you know, maybe in a week or two, once uh, there's some more numbers and, and maybe you can uh, explain it uh, to us a little better. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all uh, later uh, next week. Have a good night, everyone. Welcome to In Time. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. We read all of your comments, and if you like this video, please don't forget to share.